We've been in this series called Redeeming Your Time. And I love doing a series like this where we get really practical and give you tools and application because it always draws us back to scripture. It reminds us the Bible is relevant to our everyday struggles, that it's not just something about spiritual stuff, it's about every part of our life, that the Bible can be a tool to guide us and lead us. So if you missed any of it, I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube channel or our podcast and listen to it because it's been incredibly practical wisdom. Um, so if you don't know, I was born in India. I was born in South India and I moved to Dallas, Texas when I was seven years old. And I know some of you in the room are going to hold that against me. Not the Indian part, the Texas part. So I just want you to know from the get-go, I went to Texas Women's University we don't even have a football team, okay? I just grew up there, all right? So when I was going for grad school, I decided to go to Temple for my doctorate, and that's in Philadelphia. So I moved to Philadelphia, and it was culture shock, right? I was like, oh my gosh, this is so different than anything that I had ever known. And after a year of being there, I came home for my first summer break. And my brother looked at me and he said, you're meaner after you moved to Philly. He said, you're meaner. I was always mean to him, but now I was meaner. See, what happened was I had gotten adjusted and acclimated to the culture of Philadelphia, which is very fast paced. It is a hurry culture. And so I came back and I was getting annoyed at everybody. I was getting frustrated at my family. I was like, why is everything in Texas so slow? Why is everyone talking slow and moving slow? And I was irritable and I was frustrated. And my brother was like, you're so much meaner now. And that was 15 years ago. And I think at that time we could say that kind of culture was a part, like exclusive to some states or region of our country. But I think we can all agree that kind of culture is now a collective, all of us as a nation. We are constantly living in a state of busy, we're always in a hurry going from one thing to the next. Even on weekends when we're supposed to get a break from work, what are we doing? We're moving, we're going, we're doing all the things. And I know for me on Mondays when I get to work and a patient or a coworker asks me, hey, what'd you do this weekend? I'm usually like, you know, I don't remember. It was so busy. I wish I had more time, right? But busy doesn't mean that our life is good or more full. In fact, busyness isn't just about our schedule, it is about our heart. Research shows that Americans work more than any other nation, and it shows when we look at the mental health stats of our country. According to recent Pew Research, 100 million plus people in North America have seen a therapist in the last year. Over a hundred million just in the last year. And I want you to keep in mind, those are people who could afford, had access and time to go get help. In the recent years, you might have heard of something called the Great Resignation, where a lot of people were leaving the workforce. And there's a trend going around Gen Z, it's called quiet quitting or soft quitting, where they're saying, hey, we had our parents race us in this hurry culture of constantly teaching us to go, 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 and move, 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 and do all the things, and we recognize that it needs to change, and we're gonna change that pattern, and you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna set boundaries, and we're just gonna bear, do the bare minimum, we're gonna show up and do the necessary work, and that's it. It's called quiet quitting. And so both of those things were created in a way to protect mental health. But the problem with both of those are they're based on the idea that work is the problem. But the underlying problem is not work, it is a lack of rest. Dallas Willard says, hurry is the greatest enemy to our spiritual life, hurry. Hurry is the greatest enemy to our spiritual life. Every time I read that quote, I'm like, really? Hurry of all the things around us that we see that is broken and bad, hurry? But if you think about it, it's true, isn't it? So he says, we must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. So how do we do this? We ruthlessly eliminate hurry by embracing rest. We ruthlessly eliminate hurry by embracing rest. 
So every year after Christmas is over, we go on a road trip somewhere as a family. It's a way for us to reflect on the last year and begin the, first, the next year together as a family. And we always go somewhere special. Like it's last, last year, we went to San Antonio. We had a great time. It was our first time there. We did all the touristy stuff. We did the river walk, the Alamo, the water park, and it was so fun and relaxing. And I remember on the drive back home, looking out the window, and saying, I wish time would just slow down. How many of you guys have ever said those words? Yeah, I wish time would just slow down. Because I know that we had such a beautiful time, but as soon as we get back home, there's laundry, there's all the stuff that we have to do and all the places we have to be, and it's not going to be the same. So God, I wish time would just slow down. And even as I had that thought, the Holy Spirit put this in my heart. He said, time won't slow down, but you can. It was like one of those Holy Spirit slap you in the face type of moments for me. I was like, dang, okay, Holy Spirit. He was saying, you're asking for the impossible while refusing to do the possible. Every single human being has been given the same amount of time. And you're saying, if I just had a few more hours in my day, I would be happy. My life would be full. No, time will not slow down for you, Simi. You can. You can. So I came back. I was like, what does that look like? What does it look like for me to slow down and rest? So I, I kind of made this mental list. I was like, okay, maybe I just won't write as much for these publications that I'm writing for. Maybe I won't do as many speaking engagements. Maybe I won't go to church on Wednesday nights because I'm usually tired by the end of the day and I have to grab the kids and come all the way to Norman and I'm already tired. Yeah, that's what I'll take a rest break from. And I thought to myself, man, even in my desire to obey God, I was selfishly choosing the hard things, the things that God has gifted me to do for his kingdom, the things that bring him glory, the things that I get to actually serve people. Because you know what wasn't on my list to rest from? Binge watching Indian Matchmaker on Netflix. You know what wasn't on my list? Scrolling social media every night before I go to bed. Even though those are the things that really drain me. Because I don't think as a culture we truly understand what rest is. We think rest is something we have to do because we're sick. Rest is something that comes at the end of a hard day emotionally, physically, or mentally. But when we look at the Bible, rest is so much more than that. So we go to the creation story. We go to the very beginning of the Bible and it says that God created the universe in five days. And on day six, he creates Adam and Eve. He creates them, gives them purpose, tells them, go and be fruitful and multiply. Go have dominion over all the creation. And then day seven comes. And so it's their first day of work. They come and they're like, all right, God, we're so excited. We're here. And what does God do on day seven? He rests. What is God doing here? Is God so tired and fatigued from creating everything? No, he literally just said stuff and it existed. God is not tired. He is perfect, lacking nothing. He is teaching mankind the order in how we ought to live. Everything he had done up until then is in a specific order. And he is saying, rest comes first. We don't rest from our work we rest to work. And I began to see how God was doing this in my own life after I had that Holy Spirit slap moment. In, in the months after that, God would orchestrate for me to have these little getaways to go to places where there were no cell service and hang out women who are in ministry from different parts of the country. And, and I remember thinking in that moment, yes, I was tired. Yes, I needed rest from my work. But when I came back from those getaways, what I recognized is that I could sense what God was doing in my life and in the world around me more clearly. I could hear his voice more clearly. It wasn't just about getting away and having a time of rest from my work. God was doing something in preparing me to do the work he was getting ready for me to do. So we don't rest 
from work we rest to work. Rest isn't our last resort. Rest comes first. Our theme verse is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17. And we've been reading it every single week. And today I want to read it to you from the message paraphrase. It says, don't waste your time on useless work. Well, what is useless work? Mere busy work. What's mere busy work? The barren pursuits of darkness. Expose these things for the sham they are. It is a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness where no one will see. Rip the covers off those frauds and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. And here's where I want us to land today. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Corey Ten Boom said this, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. I think this is why rest must be first, because it is easy and almost natural for us to know that we have a purpose, that we are called to do work. And then when we see the work in front of us, we want to go and do it. Get her done, right? But it is when we rest in Christ, when we go back and we sit in his presence, we understand what the master wants. That is the place where he gives us vision and clarity and strength and wisdom and the resources we need to not just do the work, but not burn out. We see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus, before his ministry, before he goes and calls his, his disciples, he goes away. For 40 days, he fasts and prays. He is resting in the presence of the Father to understand what the Father's will is. We see how Jesus accomplishes his purpose on earth and he's ascending into heaven. He calls the disciples together and he gives them their great commission. Go into all the world with this gospel message. But first, go and wait and rest in the upper room. There you will receive the Holy Spirit. Then you will have the power to go and do the thing that I've called you to do. But Simi, we have goals. We have stuff to do. We have a limited amount of time on this world, earth. What, what are you talking about? Wait, rest? Rest is actually productive for our goals and our souls. So to redeem our time in the model of our Redeemer, we must embrace rest that is productive for our goals and our souls. John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. He's saying, listen, I have goals for you. I chose you and I put my potential and my purpose in you. I have things for you to accomplish right here in this world. But first, what do you have to do? John chapter 15, verse 1, he starts with, but you got to abide in me. First, you got to rest in me. You got to remain in me. Then you'll be able to bear fruit and fruit that lasts. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. I am a physical therapist, and so I work in an outpatient clinic and have patients coming to me because they're in pain and they're not able to do the things that they wanna do. So what I do on a daily basis is I sit with my patients and I set goals with them to help them achieve those functional things that they wanna do without much pain. And what I do is I use exercise as the medium to get them there, right? And so I'll have this session, 45 minute session planned out for my patients. And I know what the session's gonna be like. I know there's gonna be some things in there that are easy and some things that are gonna be really challenging for them. So I have these intervals of rest planned throughout the session. Especially if they're gonna do something hard, I have them rest for a little bit longer because I want them to do it well. 
But then I'll get a patient here and there that they're like, no, I don't want to rest. I'm here for 45 minutes. I want my full 45 minutes. I paid for 45 minutes. I can rest when I get home. I'm like, okay. And without a doubt, that patient will come back the next time. They're like, I was so sore. I couldn't move for two days. I'm like, yeah, because you didn't listen when I told you to rest. Because rest actually helps you do more and do it better. And our mind works the same way. I think a lot of us live life like this. We are doing all the things, we're at all the places, and we're making all these plans, and God is calling us to a time of rest. He's trying to pull us away, and he's saying, I need you to slow down because I know what's coming in the next season of your life. I know what's about to happen in that program. I know what's about to happen at work. I know what's about to happen in your relationship, and you're going to need this time of rest for that strength you need for that inner courage you need, but we ignore him and we keep going. We're like, but God, I gotta do this. I gotta be there. I gotta be everything for all these people. I gotta show up. And then we're paralyzed with fear and anxiety. We're frustrated, we're irritable, we're angry, and we blame God. And much like I told my patient, God looks at him and says, I told you. It's in the 10 Commandments. Did you not watch the movie or read the book? <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. This is the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in it. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Remember the Sabbath. This is a first commandment that starts with the word remember. Remember, I think God knew we would forget the one about don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. He's like, they're going to remember that one. But this one, they're going to forget. So I'm going to tell them, I'm going to command them to remember the Sabbath. And what does he tell them? What are you going to remember? Remember the rhythm I set for you in the very beginning, how I rested. Resting to work, not from work. It's also interesting because this is the first time the word holy is mentioned in scripture. You would think it'd be like, honor your parents, for this is holy, right? I, I'm a parent, I would like that. But no, he says Sabbath is holy. Why is this so important to the heart of God? Why is God saying the Sabbath is holy? I think it's because a restlessness leads to idolatry. We live in a culture of hustle and achieve, accumulate and accomplish. We want more. Leaving us chasing contentment and satisfaction because that marker of success keeps moving, doesn't it? And we become restless and we turn to these little gods of Netflix and alcohol and food and shopping and sex because our souls are so restless. So God commands his people, remember the Sabbath. Theologians tell us that Sabbath is the fourth commandment in the 10. The first are all about our relationship with God, and the last five are about our relationship with other people. And this command to Sabbath ties it all together because remember, what happens when we rest? We understand the master's will. Maybe like me, some of you work eight to nine hour shifts. I don't know about you, but the longer the day gets, the harder it is to love people. Right? It's hard to extend grace and not be offended by some of the things that people say and do. And you're like, man, is it five o'clock yet? Right? And what I had to do was I had to know when I sense that in my spirit that I have to rest. I have to get away. I have to create pockets in my day to get away, which is really hard for my job because every 45 minutes someone walks in to see me and I have paperwork. And so what I did was I built this rhythm like during my lunch break, I have 30 minutes to get away physically from my workstation. And that's what I do. 
So sometimes I'll drive home because it's an eight minute drive. Sometimes I'll go on a walk outside and listen to a sermon or sit in my car and listen to worship music. And just that 30 minutes away from my physical workstation just really refreshes my soul and I am ready to come back to work. It's like the old Snickers commercial. I don't know if you guys remember the old Snickers commercials where they used to be super, super funny. I have my favorite one for you actually. They're gonna play that video. Marsha, what happened? Peter hit me in the nose with a football. I can't go to the dance like this. Well, I'm sure it was an accident, sweetheart. An eye for an eye. That's what Dad always says. I never said that, honey. Shut up! <laughs> God, you teach Peter a lesson. Marsha, eat a Snickers. Why? You get a little hostile when you're hungry. Better? Better. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Jan, this isn't about you. <laughs> it never is! <laughs> Oh my goodness, you are not you when you don't Sabbath, right? You are not you when you don't Sabbath. We know this. We're so good at calling this out in other people. We are so good at calling this out in our children. We're like, man, you're, you're worn out, you're tired. That's why you're having this meltdown and you're acting out. You need to go and sit somewhere and calm down. You need to take a nap because you're not you when you don't Sabbath. And it isn't just Snickers that's making money off of that. Have you seen the drug commercials, right? Every ad for a new drug is like this. Are you feeling tired, moody, bloated? And we're like, maybe, a little bit, right? <laughs> Trouble focusing, falling asleep, losing weight. We're like, yes, yes. Well, then ask your doctor about this new pill. I think I will. I will ask him. And God's over here like, I already told you what you need. It's called rest. Take it once a week. We're like, well, that's kind of old school, God, and this is so much easier. Just have to take a pill, right? Sure, the side effect is possible death, but I think I'll try that, right? That's how we live. Sabbath in Hebrew is the word Shabbat, Shabbat, and it means stop. And I remember growing up, a lot of my prayers sounded like God sent me. Use me. Take me to that place. I want to do that for you. I want to go here. And as I have matured in my walk with God and I have experienced him and tasted his goodness, my prayers have become more, God, stop me. Help me to stand in awe and wonder of who you are. Show me your glory. And what changed is I recognized that God is not my boss or a taskmaster looking at my productivity stats. He is my good, good father who loves me and deeply cares about my soul. And so not only was my doing holy to him, my stopping was holy. In Luke chapter 10, we see the story of Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha are the sisters of Lazarus, the guy who was dead, and Jesus brought back to life. And they are friends with Jesus. Jesus loves this family. And so Martha, the sister, decides to invite Jesus to her home. And Martha is a type A personality. She has to be a type A personality. She is doing all the things, getting the house ready, because Jesus is a big deal. Jesus doesn't travel alone, right? He has 12 disciples and a crowd following him and random people coming to get healed and all this stuff all the time. So she knows this. So she is getting food ready. She's making there's enough place for people to sit and she's doing all the things. And Luke 10, verse 40 to 42, it says, Martha was distracted by her many tasks and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to give me a hand. And Jesus said, you're not you when you don't Sabbath. No, he didn't say that. He's way kinder than me. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. <laughs> Jesus says, you are worried about so many things. Jesus is reading our mail, y'all. We are slaves to our iPhones and our iPads and our emails and our to-do lists, our job duties and our kids' activities. Because here's the thing, Martha was doing good things. She was stewarding her God-given gifts 
of hospitality and creativity, but in her doing, her gifts got in the way of being with the giver. And it amazes me that Jesus is literally in the room with her. Jesus, the hope of the world, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and this woman is in the room with him, and she is anxious. She is distraught. She is angry. She is frustrated. She misses out on Jesus. And she's the one who invited him. This was her plan. I think a lot of the followers of Jesus live like this. They have Jesus in the corner of their heart, but he's not at the center of their heart. He is not the king of their heart. So they end up bowing down to pride and greed and success and people pleasing all while doing good things. And they end up missing out on Jesus. So we're empty, we're anxious, and we feel burnt out. So Jesus says one thing is necessary. Martha, one thing is needed to Shabbat, to stop and rest so we can understand what the master wants. What is Jesus inviting her to? He's saying, come sit with me. This is, a, this is not Jesus scolding her. Jesus is inviting her to a place of honor. That's why he says, this is better. You know why? Because to sit under a rabbi was a position for men in that culture to be a disciple. And he's saying, I want that for you. I see your heart. I see all the things you want to do for my people and my kingdom. I'm going to choose you for something better. I don't want you to live a life of striving. I want you to sit with me. I want you to know my heart. Jesus is inviting her to join in his joy. And this invitation is not just for Martha. It is for all of us. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 Jesus says, look at me. I stand at the door. I knock. If you hear me call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. Friends, he is not interested in our capacity as much as he's interested in having communion with us. This is the heart of God, that we would sit with him, that we would know his heart, that we would join in his joy. And he's saying, look at me. I'm standing here and I'm knocking, but you can't hear me because you are so busy and you're distracted by a hurry and I'm standing here knocking. And if you will just hear me and you hear me call your name and come to the door and open, I will come in and sit with you and I will dine with you. Sabbath is an invitation to join in his joy. It's not about laws or rules, and it's not an Old Testament thing. We see Jesus teaching about it. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He's saying, listen, this is a gift. God made the Sabbath for you to bless your life so you can experience abundant life. This rest is a gift. So how do we practically embrace rest? How do we live this out? How do we Sabbath? I made this uh, phrase for you, the three G's. It's going to go up there. Yep. To help you remember. So the first one is gaze. That just means that you are looking up and delighting in God. You're delighting in the beauty of nature. You are looking at the people in your lives, the house you have, the car you have that runs, and you're saying, God, you are good. You are gazing at the beauty of God. Because here's the thing. Most of the time, our week was so hard. Work was demanding. People were not nice. And we're stressed out. And our mind has a tendency to hold on to those negative things. And we need a day to remember and reflect on the goodness of God. Because if we don't, we will be in a state of hopelessness and we will be depressed. And delight is the antidote for depression because when we delight in God and we see the beauty and the goodness of God in our lives and around us, 
we see glimmers of hope and hope heals our soul. Second, graze. And I chose that word because this isn't simply eating good food. This is actually just enjoying food and eating slowly. Right? We're not rushing to the next thing. Hurry up and finish your burger so we can go to the next thing. This is, we're eating and we're talking. So a lot of times when you hear this, you're like, how do I do this? I don't have 24 hours to sit, right? So for you, maybe it's just half a day. That's what we do. Sundays are our Sabbath. After church is over, it is Sabbath for us. So as a family, we go out to eat because we want to graze. We don't want to do dishes. We don't want to worry about cooking. We go out to eat. We let the kids pick and we go somewhere and we have these little apps that we find conversation starters. So we ask our kids questions and we're enjoying telling jokes and we're having fun as we eat good food. This is what they did on the Sabbath. Three, last one is games. That just means play and have fun. You're going to enjoy the people in your life. Sabbath was actually a party. They would get together and just have a party, a good time. So this is get together and enjoy the people in your life. It could be board games. It could be card games. It could be outside. Whatever it is, it is being present with the people in your lives and not rushing to the next thing, actually enjoying them. So in a Jewish home, Sabbath would begin as the woman of the house would go and light two candles. And they would put this candle by the windows so that everybody in the neighborhood and everybody in the home would know we're resting. Sabbath has started. And so as she would light the candle, she would say two words. The first candle, she would say, remember. It was for the two times God commanded the children of Israel to Sabbath. So we read the first one in the Ten Commandments where God tells them to remember the Sabbath. So they would light the candle and they would say, remember. And the second one comes from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12, where God tells them to remember the Sabbath again. But he doesn't say remember. He says observe. Because this is for a different generation. This is not the same audience that's hearing this command. This is generations after. So he tells them observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And there's a subtle difference in what he says to them. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, nor any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, that the Lord your God brought you out with a, a, a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore... The Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Here it's a little bit different. The first one was because I set this rhythm of rest for you. Remember what I did in the garden. But here he says, remember who you were before. You were slaves. And so I want you to observe the Sabbath because there's going to be a tendency in your heart that is bent towards slavery. And I don't want you to be enslaved by things and people. So I'm calling you to observe. That word observe means watch over or guard. So they would light that second candle to remember and then the second one to guard, to observe. In the Old Testament, Sabbath was a commandment. But in the New Testament for us, it is an invitation. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, it's one of my favorite verses. This is Jesus' invitation to each of us. It's like he knew each one of us, isn't it? When you read this verse, he says, Are you tired, worn out, burn out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Friend, if you are here today, 
Jesus is offering you a real rest from striving to find worth or significance. If you're here today, Jesus is offering you a real rest from hiding from your struggles and your past. If you're here today, Jesus is offering you a real rest from your fear and anxiety. Jesus is here offering a real rest to equip you, to refresh you, and to revive your soul, to keep going and do the thing that he has created you to do. See, our Christian faith is a faith that is based on the hope that one day we will have eternal rest with Christ. We read about this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. It says, therefore, a time of eternal rest exists for God's people. Those who entered his place of rest also rest from their work as God did from his. What if, what if God was inviting us to these patterns, this rhythm of rest on a weekly basis to remind us that this world is not our home? that there is an eternal rest waiting for us. A place where there is no school shooting, there is no bomb threat, there is no cancer, there is no more sickness, there is no more tears, there is no more depression or suicide, where there is eternal hope and peace and joy. What if we're supposed to celebrate this moment, these moments of rest to remind us that this is just a taste of the joy that we will experience one day. Jesus' last words on the cross was, it is finished. It is finished. He has done the work so that we can rest from striving. We can rest from all the things that we think we have to earn. He has done the work necessary for us to experience rest. Let's pray together. 